All right, assalamu alaikum and a very good morning Malaysian time. Um, I bid to all of you here from wherever you are. Um, I'm here on behalf of Professor Dr. Ari Zagnan, our Deputy Dean of Industry, Community and Alumni Network, um, as well as the advisor of the International Webinar Series of our faculty, um, who's unable to be here this morning due to an unavoidable engagement at the hospital. Um, she's asked me to step in and I'll do my best to represent her. Um, it's a great honor and a pleasure um, that I welcome our guest speaker today, Professor Emeritus Dr. Emily Goff, for being able to grace us today with his presence, um, albeit virtually, uh, to talk about a topic which I think bores interest across all walks of life, um, which is how insects can be used um, in criminal investigations. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to, to thank Dr. Hir Chiang Chin as the chairperson of the Forensics, um, Urban and Nutritional Entomology Laboratory, or Sun Into Lab, um, who has been very instrumental in bringing the world closer to our institution through his initiatives of organizing webinars such as this. Um, the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Technology Mara, having been officially established in November of 2002, um, has always made it a mission to encourage the sharing and dissemination of invaluable knowledge, um, as well as striving towards creating a conducive research ecosystem uh, through the establishments of various research facilities within the faculty that not only houses our internal researchers, uh, but also researchers from various other institutions uh, nationally as well as internationally. The faculty's research facilities um, include the Institute um, of um, Medical Molecular Biotechnology, as uh, Dr. Hugh had mentioned, IMNB, um, IMNB um, which also houses the Fun Enter Lab, um, as well as the Laboratory Animal Care Unit, um, and they're all in one building. We also have the Clinical Diagnostics Laboratory, um, as well as the Imaging Department, um, and those are located at the Clinical Specialist Centers in the Sunlar Blue and Sion campuses, um, as well as our new 400-bedded UITM hospital um, that was launched earlier this year. And both uh, those facilities actually support um, not only clinical, but as well as research activities. Um, just uh, allow me to give a little overview of the financial lab. Um, and this is really a faculty community um, that was founded by Dr. Hill. Um, and um, it aimed to bring awareness on the various aspects of entomology, aiming to inspire younger generations to become future entomologists and researchers um, in Malaysia. Uh, to realize this vision, the Fun Enter Lab conducts various programs throughout the years, um, such as field trips, um, science fairs for elementary school children, um, as well as online webinars such as this one, uh, which serves as a platform for entomologists and various other researchers to share and exchange knowledge in entomological and biological fields. Um, once again, on behalf of the faculty, I'd like to thank Dr. Hyo and the Fun and Tool Lab team for their continued endeavors, as well as to extend our heartfelt thanks to Professor Goff, who I'm sure will be significantly contributing to the success of the webinar today. With that, I give the platform back to the organizers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. And lastly, I would like to invite Dr. Tanya Ivora, the program coordinator for today's event, to introduce our speaker of the day. Please welcome. Thank you, Adila. Uh, good morning, everyone. Aloha, Dr. Goff, and welcome to our seventh uh -huh. FUN International Webinar Series. The topic of today's webinar, entitled Dr. Mago and Mr. War, Insects as Evidence in Criminal Investigations, which will be presented by your guest speaker, Prof. Emeritus Dr. Lee Goff from Chaminade University of Honolulu in USA. First, let me introduce our, our speaker. Dr. Goff obtained his PhD in entomology from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and currently he's working as a professor, a professor emeritus at Chaminade University of Honolulu. During his scientific career, he has published more than 200 peer review scientific publications in the field of entomology, legal medicine, or multidisciplinary sciences. And he has delivered keynote lectures in several workshops, symposium, and international conferences. In addition, he's author uh, of the best-selling book, A Fly for the Prosecution, which has been translated among, among other languages into Spanish with the title, El Testimonio de las Moscas, Como los Insectos Ayudan a Resolver Crímenes. So without, without further ado, please welcome Dr. Goff. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be able to provide this uh, little discussion to, uh, with you. Certainly always look forward to being able to interact with people from uh, different areas. I guess 
start off by uh, wishing everybody a good morning, afternoon, or evening, judging from the uh, different locations I've heard So I came in. Uh, those of you that stayed up very late to hear this, I kind of worry about you a little bit, but uh, that's okay. We'll, we'll get over that one. Um, using the title here, uh, Dr. Maggot and Mr. Worm, uh, it's kind of a universal title. What I plan on doing uh, a little bit this morning, afternoon, or evening is providing you with kind of an introduction to the different areas in which I have encountered insects being used as evidence in different criminal investigations. Before I get into that, um, I'd like to start off with something I kind of stole from Dr. Henry Lee some time back. And I think it uh, tells us a lot. Now, Henry um, basically tells us that uh, he can divide people into three basic categories. Those who make things happen, those who watch things happen, and those who wonder what the hell just happened. Well, according to Henry, we should all be in the first category. Those who make things happen. Well, I tend to disagree with him in there um, for a couple of reasons, but the main one, I, I would like to see more people in the category of those who wonder what the hell just happened. For the simple reason, if we don't wonder what happened, we will never really explore things that are new. Okay? It's only by wondering what happened that we start. It's only by wondering what happened that we conduct experiments, that we make observations. So really, this is the start point as far as I'm concerned. Probably the best way to discuss or demonstrate the uses of insects is by actually going into case histories in uh, the use of insects in investigations. And we have really seven uh, different ways in which we currently use insects with a certain, certain amount of routine in uh, different criminal investig investigations. We have this idea of estimating the post-mortem interval. We had the idea of being able to tell whether or not remains have been moved after death. Was the individual killed in the spot in which he was found or was he killed somewhere else and the body then moved? Sometimes insects can assist us in determining if there was an anti-mortem injury. It's very frequently the uh, processes of decomposition are going to obscure the wound. But insects can provide us with uh, somewhat of a clue. Insects on occasion can help to characterize the crime scene, the habitat. What was going on at that or in that scene at the time that the crime was committed? Insects can occasionally provide us with some very valuable clues in that respect. More recently, toxicological analyses. You get to the body and there isn't enough left of the body to get normal tissues for toxicological analyses. Well, we can substitute insects. And then there's another aspect of that of what does the presence of a drug or a toxin in tissues actually have on the development of the insect? Can this throw our estimation of the postmortem interval off? Definite possibility. We can also use them as sources of human DNA. Okay. Usually here we're looking at parasitic insects. And finally, the one that has been particularly disturbing uh, to work with, at least for me, is the cases where we have abuse and neglect of children and the elderly, which is actually brought to light by the presence of insects, brought to light by myiasis, things of this nature. So these are the seven probably most common ways in which insects can be used. We'll start with the postmortem interval estimation. Um, that's about 98% of what we do. And let's clarify that a little bit. 
Because you say estimating the postmortem interval. <coughs> well, first, something that is very significant is the word estimation. Okay, we are not in the business of providing an exact time since death. We're estimating it. We weren't there. And generally, what we need to do is provide an estimate of the minimum period of insect activity. <laughs> we cannot actually tell what may have happened at that time of death to that body. We weren't there. There could be something where the body was first concealed and insects couldn't get to it. There may be conditions in which the insects uh, really could not access the body. In many instances, we don't know that. Okay, so we provide an estimate of the minimum period. Now, some individuals say, oh, hey, I can provide an exact time since death. Well, common sense really tells us that that doesn't work all that well. Okay. In fact, rarely works at all. Under very specialized circumstances, it may be possible to provide a maximum period of time since death. But if you ever find yourself in that uh, position, be very, very careful because you may inadvertently supply an alibi to someone who, in fact, is guilty of the crime. So with that, let's take a look at how we're going to do it. Generally speaking, if the body is exposed, very shortly after death, <coughs> female fly is going to locate the body. She's going to come down to the natural body openings, most frequently those associated with the head, also the anus and genitals if they're exposed, and finally the third choice for the majority of species seems to be <coughs> any wounds, wounds that were inflicted uh, while the individual was still alive and uh, while blood was flowing. Female fly comes down, she explores the body. <coughs> Gonna look around, check out, is, you know, is this gonna be a good place to raise the kids? Okay, if it is, she's going to start laying eggs. And as soon as she lays the eggs, she really starts a biological clock because that egg is gonna hatch into the uh, maggots and they'll go through their development, going through the three larval stages, first, second, and third instars. That's what we, in the taxa we usually use uh, when they've reached full development. Then you'll have a so-called resting stage or cuparium being formed and out of that, the adult fly will emerge. Okay. When we come in, we collect the specimen and then we work backwards to determine when the egg was laid. That will be your minimum period of time since death. <laughs> Want to be very familiar with what they look like. And this is a cluster of blowfly eggs. Probably the two uh, families we deal with the most are going to be the Californidae and the Sarcophagidae. Californids typically are going to lay clusters of eggs, generally around two to 400 eggs per oviposition per female. So it doesn't take too many of the uh, female flies showing up in order to have a uh, pretty good healthy population of maggots. If it's a sarcophagid, typically they are going to deposit not eggs, but they're going to deposit uh, living first in star larvae. Uh, they will not deposit as many, but they do have a slight uh, survival advantage in being alive as opposed to immobile as the eggs are. <coughs> eggs hatch, we have the first, second, and third in star larvae. Determine which uh, instar we're dealing with, we take a look at the posterior end of the body. And here you can see, or at least I hope you can see, a pair of circular structures. These are the posterior spiracles. Makes perfect sense. Maggot is sitting with the head down and decomposing muck and mire. And through evolution, um, basically, 
the posterior spiracles have become the major breathing organs for the uh, maggot. First instar, kind of a token pair of uh, openings. Second instar in uh, calliphorids, we have two slits on either side. The third instar, we have three slits on either side. <coughs> Please excuse me as I cough away here. It's a little dry in this room. Uh, once the larval development has been completed, then the last larval skin becomes hardened and tanned. The uh, maggot goes into this puparium. Once it's in here, then uh, all the cells that used to be the maggot break down. <clears throat> and we have a second embryology essentially occurring. And out of this, we get the adult fly. Now, this works great for the first two weeks. But after the first two weeks, by and large, the uh, initial invading flies are going to have completed their development or be ready to complete their development. And so now we have to look at the process of succession. Uh, not a single species of fly is going to be exploiting a particular corpse, but what we are going to find is that we have a whole succession of different insects that are going to come in at different times and different stages of development. And basically here um, in Hawaii, we have about 360 plus uh, species of insects that we will recover from a body between the time of death and the time it is reduced to a complete skeleton. You have to be aware of what happens. Here are two very early invaders, both in the genus Chrysomyo, Megacephala and Rufa fossies. You know, Megacephala, which is the uh, whiter one with the prominent spiracles, is probably the first invader. Shortly after that, the Chrysomyo Rufa fossies, which is your so-called hairy maggot, um, shows up. For a while, both will feed on the decomposing body, but then you run out of decomposing body. Well, Chrysomyia megacephala can only feed on the decomposing material. Chrysomyia rufifosis, by contrast, will sit there and uh, cheerfully turn into a predator, and its favorite prey is Chrysomyia megacephala, as you can see here. Okay. So let's take a look at a couple of cases. This is in California. This is a 16-year-old military dependent who went out with some friends. Apparently got to know them quite well that night. He was a victim of homosexual rape and his body was uh, discarded out in this somewhat grassy field. Um, quite a bit of blood. Okay? And the pattern of this blood also tells us that in fact, uh, he was not in that position at the time he died. Uh, he actually was uh, transported and the body was dumped there. But the significant part is there's a lot of blood. We already have uh, some maggots that have moved in. And if you look here, we have a little staphylinid beetle, Creophilus maxillosus. Uh, he's not there. Uh, for the body, he's just there because he likes to eat maggots and fly eggs. Turn the body over. And you see here a whole series of fly eggs. These were deposited on the body uh, after the um, body was turned over. Up here, we have quite a nice little mass of maggots. They went and invaded in their normal pattern, starting with the head and then working down. They are predominantly attracted to the different mucous membranes. Okay, another shot just to show you the, again, the eggs and uh, again, your maggot mass. Now, in this particular instance, we had a single species of fly here, which was um, Venetia sericata. And this one was there developing quite nicely, it had third end star maggots. And they indicated, given the uh, ambient temperatures in the area, <coughs> that they had been developing for about three and a half days. Okay. 
everybody was pretty happy with that. There's one little problem here. If you mark back three and a half days from the time, <coughs> time the body was uh, discovered, uh, this would put you in the middle of the night. Flies do not like typically flying around at night. But if you look here, see some very tall grasses. Okay, these grasses are a perfect overwintering or probably overnight uh, roosting for Phoenicia sericata. So while they don't go out and actively forage at night, uh, if a body is dumped close to them, they will migrate a short distance and begin ovipositing. Now to get a little more complicated, here we are on the north shore of the island of Oahu here in Hawaii. And we had a woman who had been reported missing. She had been gone for about 13 days and they had everybody out looking for her. We had the police out, we had the military out, we had the Boy Scouts out, we had the Girl Scouts out, you, you name it, we had them looking for this woman in the area in which she was believed to have disappeared. <clears throat> well, New Year's Eve afternoon, uh, they found the body. I was asked to go out and, um, well, Everybody said, well, you know, it's New Year's Eve. We'll understand if you just want to look at the body of the morgue uh, tomorrow. Well, I had my in-laws in town, so I had a choice. I could go out to the dead body or go to dinner or a party and a party with my in-laws. Yeah. It was a hard choice, but I got on my motorcycle and went out to the dead body. Um, the scary part was my wife and two daughters tried to get into the uh, car and follow along behind me, but um, it went fairly quickly. I got out, pulled the body out of the uh, brush, and we had a body that was wrapped up very nicely in a blanket, tied with an ace bandage. Took that off and we found... Hmm, a second blanket. So this uh, body was wrapped in two layers of blankets. If you take a look at the, uh, here you have some adult flies. You also have uh, some intact puparia present. We take the blanket off. Invasion, even though the body was well wrapped in the blanket uh, and the only actual openings were down in this area. The maggots um, were up in the head. All of this was not pantyhose, but in fact, uh, this was skin slippage. It's fairly wet area. You had the maggots behaving normally. We had a lot of intact puparia present on the uh, on the body. Again, this is another good example of skin slippage. We had second instar larvae of Chrysomia megacephala. We also had third instar. We had intact puparia. These are the posterior spiracles of a second species of fly, Chrysomia rufosis. We had adult flies come to the body as soon as it was unwrapped. We had a staphylinid beetle that was present. Okay, well, taking a look at what we had, the oldest um, specimens present were in fact the intact puparia. It was significant that in fact, none of the uh, puparia showed signs of emergence. So I took the puparia and I put them in an environmental chamber Kept careful track of the temperature, correlated that with the temperature at the scene. And eventually, when the adult flies emerged, found that I was able to account for about 10 and a half days of insect activity. <clears throat> the woman had been missing for 13 days. Everybody was pretty happy with my explanation that if you wrap something up, it slows down the um, access by the flies except for the defense attorney. <clears throat> the woman's husband was in fact uh, charged with murder. But 
his defense attorney was determined that there had to be some way to actually make this a little narrower. And he was up to calling me six, seven times a day. And I was getting sick of his phone calls. So I got a dead pig, 50 pound pig, uh, which I use as an animal model for human decomposition. And I duplicated the wrappings. I looked for a somewhat uh, remote, distur undisturbed area which to put the dead pig. Finally hit on my backyard. So I put the dead pig in my backyard and I visited it um, every couple hours. And it took two and a half days before the uh, flies penetrated the wrappings and were able to uh, lay their eggs. So two and a half plus 10 and a half gave us 13. And this in fact accounted for the entire time that the uh, woman had been missing. But now we're on the island of Kauai. In the island of Kauai, um, not a lot goes on. We had a guy who was taking his dog out for a walk. His dog kind of ran off into the side in this area and came back with a bone, which quite obviously was not a cow bone or a dog bone or a mongoose bone. Um, he went over and took a look and he found the skeletal remains laying off in the brush. Okay, so uh, here we have a little problem. Who is it? How did they die? When did they die? Why did they happen to be out there? Well, taking a look at the who was it? We got the people from the uh, Forensic Anthropology Laboratory out here at Pearl Harbor. They went over it and they determined that these were in fact the remains of a 52 year old Caucasian female. They got a forensic odontologist who came down and in fact was able to uh, determine that in fact uh, this was an individual who had been kind of missing she was somebody who kind of uh, was around and then she was gone and then she was around again. Uh, finally, she was just gone. I took a look at the insects that were there. Even though we're looking at skeletal remains, there were still insects that were present. We had a cheese skipper by Villacaceae. We had a staphylinid beetle. And we had a black soldier fly, Stratiomyid. Okay, now in this instance, here in Hawaii, um, this uh, Pyophila is uh, around until about day 35 to 36 on a dead body. Comes in around day 18. This guy is not of much use at all. He is a predator, comes and goes, no particular schedule. Here's more or less the hero of our show, the Stratiomyot. This one comes in late in Hawaii. Okay, Other parts of the world, it comes in a little bit earlier, but here we don't see it around until um, 25, maybe 30 days. It takes a while for it to develop. This one was a developmental stage of that indicated 34 days. In this particular case, the uh, individual that was a suspect claimed that he had given the woman a ride home and he gave us a date and it would have been 32 days prior to discovery of the remains. This was not working at all and he was ultimately convicted of murder. Now, relocation of remains, this is fairly simple when you stop and look at it. <coughs> Basically, if you find a body with insects on it where those insects do not actually belong um, in this location, um, this is a pretty good indication that that body started somewhere else. It was exposed to insect activity 
and subsequently moved. Okay, very simple. Anti-mortem injury assessment. Okay, if you take a look at insect invasion, particularly the maggots, you have a pattern as to how they go into the body. An intact body, okay, they are going to start with the natural body openings of the head. Okay, this is going to be your primary source. You'll have some secondary invasion down the anus and genitals, but then you have wounds. Wounds provide an alternate portal of entry for the insects to get into the body. Okay. So if you take a body and you look at it, and very frequently, by the time we get there and take a look at it, uh, this body has been pretty well obliterated. There's not an awful lot left. But you can see differences in patterns of insect invasion into that body. And these can give you some clues that there, something had happened there. Something provided an alternate portal of entry. And then you want to take a look. Take a look very carefully. Actually, the pathologist would be the one to take a look very carefully. But um, you may <coughs> you may uh, locate knife wounds. You may see entrance wounds for bullets. Things of this nature. The insects provide a clue as to what's going on there. <coughs> Habitat crime scene characterization. Well. Okay. <coughs> this is the life cycle of a chigger mite. Family Trombiculidae, also the family Levonochiidae. Um, so why has he got this up here? Doesn't make any sense. Well, there are two reasons. One is that I've worked on uh, trombiculid mites since 1968. And, you know, nobody ever asks me to talk about trombiculid mites. So, as long as I have you all here, I'll be talking about trombiculid mites for the next five and a half hours. No, not really. <laughs> but the trick is that uh, this particular beast is parasitic only during the uh, larval stage. All the post-larval stages are free living. <laughs> It's very closely tied to a given habitat. Okay. This is what it looks like. They're actually, rather attractive little beasts. This one's slightly out of focus. Uh, and this is from South America, but uh, that's beside the point. Um, it's very attractive. You kind of get hooked on them. And we had a we'll go to Texas. You want a weird case, you go to Texas. Either t Texas or Tennessee. Take your pick. <laughs> But um, he had a young woman who was uh, very brutally raped, left for dead. And um, when she was found, she had sugar bites. Okay. They were fresh sugar bites. He had several suspects in this particular case. One of the suspects this is the non-functional side of a rapist. They had um, bites that were very typical in shape and distribution on the body for trigger bites. Now, he claimed that he had um, not left the city limits. He had a nice little version of the bite um, during the period of time in question. And he gave us several different locations in which he said he was and where he probably got the, uh, the bites. And these included sleeping outside his uh, former girlfriend's apartment. <clears throat> he, we went and checked on that and she had not seen him. Uh, but there was, <coughs> there was nothing around the area uh, that would in fact have bitten him. Turned out he had picked out about the only space in, let's say, about a 150-mile radius that had chiggers that would actually um, bite people. This was sufficient to place him at the scene of the crime, and he was ultimately convicted. 
Now, toxicological analyses. Again, um, by analyzing maggots, and they ingest things, they tend to store them in their fat body. And we've picked up a number of different inorganic uh, substances. Uh, virtually all of the insecticides we've looked for, <clears throat> a very wide variety of recreational uh, substances. And there, in fact, these are all just very, very uh, rudimentary lists. The lists are actually much longer. But an example of how it works, it's an individual in uh, Connecticut who uh, in December was putting a, an air conditioner into his girlfriend's apartment. He turned it on to test it, got cold, and for some reason he became very upset, uh, fortified himself with a certain amount of cocaine and went for a long walk. Well, he... Um, was found later on in uh, March, and his head wasn't there. His head was a little distance away. Some dogs had found it. Now, dogs like skulls. You know, they're kind of like a big ball for them. Uh, things were pretty well gone at that point, but there had been a couple of thaws, and there were uh, some maggots. They were an analyzed, and we got a positive... Uh, <coughs> Uh, for cocaine, and ultimately it was determined that, in fact, he, in fact, had uh, succumbed to hyperthermia while under the influence of cocaine. That's what the body looked like when we got it uh, back into the morgue. Now, one little side point was uh, been kind of cold sitting out there, and there was a family of mice that, in fact, was looking for someplace to spend the winter, so they kind of moved into his ass and set up housekeeping. But what happens to all these poor maggots that are sitting there and having to consume um, all these drugs? Is this going to affect them at all? Well, seemed like a good question, so conducted an experiment with uh, cocaine, which was the most popular drug at the time. And as we see with it from the results here, it very clearly shows, not really, uh, put it under a graph, you see that uh, the maggots fed on tissues that had a lethal and twice lethal dosage of cocaine developed at a significantly greater rate than those with the recreational dosage and the control. Incidentally, this is a wonderful slide. If you have to give a presentation and you don't want anybody to know what you're talking about, just put this slide up. You can talk about anything you want to. No one will ever know. So what we found was <coughs> cocaine <laughs> increases the rate of larval development. It kicks in between hours uh, 34 and 78 of development. No actual change in mortality. In fact, they seem to grow a little bit better on cocaine. The analysis, positive is benzalecanine, and you can be off anywhere from 12 to 18 hours. <coughs> Look at amitriptyline. Uh, rate of larval development is decreased. Uh, lasts through all of the larval instars. You have a pretty high larval mortality, 42.5 to 57.5 percent, where the mortality of the control is only 5.5 percent. <coughs> you get a positive analysis for amitriptyline for both the larvae and the pupae, and <coughs> you can be off by uh, 30, 30 hours. Methamphetamine, mixed effects, uh, increased rate of puparial development. Larva tends to be kind of weird. Uh, duration of the effect it, uh, goes through the total developmental period. Again, uh, puparial mortality is pretty high. 21.4 to 60.6 .6 in the puparia uh, with a control at 4.4%. Uh, Larval analysis, uh, positive for the methamphetamine. 
the possible error here, <coughs> 48 hours. 3,4-methylene-dioxymethamphetamine, um, effect increased rate of larval development. Last hours, 24 to 114. Mortality is lower for treated colonies. Uh, significant here, PMI error can be 23 hours. And then we come to this abuse and neglect of children and the elderly. So going through quickly, here is a woman in a nursing home. And uh, basically, they say she's being cleaned and bathed on a routine basis. She has some trouble with a sore. You have more trouble explaining the five-day-old maggots that are cheerfully uh, growing in there. Actually, they're providing a service for her. They're obviously the only ones uh, in that nursing home who are, interest, who are interested in caring for her. Um, the other thing is they're giving us the evidence that we need to go through and prosecute the uh, nursing home. Another one, this is a child, Edicolopta, who was abandoned by the side of a lake. She was laying face down when she was discovered, all down the face of the uh, pants, uh, fly eggs. <clears throat> they had probably initially been attracted by the fecal material in the diapers. When they ran out of diaper, they began feeding on the child. Okay. Um, she was taken to the hospital. She recovered. It's been now adopted by her aunt there. But um, basically, again, the maggots provided the uh, evidence that was needed for the prosecution. Sources of human DNA? <clears throat> well, let's go back to Texas again. Uh, that woman who was, in fact, again, raped, left for dead, not successful. She had a pretty good case of crabs. There was pubis. Well, weren't too sure what to do, but we had all these crab lice, blood and gorged. We had one suspect who had crabs. Well, what do you do? First, you conduct an experiment. So we uh, advertised around the University of Miami for uh, volunteers, uh, heavily infested with uh, crab lice, collected the crab lice, extracted the blood, although we did send an FBI agent out, asked him to get some, uh, some crabs. Um, you have to be really specific with these people. <clears throat> this is what we're looking for. Thurus pubis, extracted the blood from the gut, and you know, we got a positive match. It worked out very nicely. So then we go and get the crab lice from the woman and we got a blood sample from the suspect and able to determine that, in fact, his blood was in the crabs that were on her. That was sufficient to provide the connection, and he was, in fact, uh, convicted. And sometimes you're just lucky. This is down in uh, Tennessee. We had a guy who uh, committed a murder. It was a fashion plate. And the guy that he killed, he beat to death. And on the guy that was beaten to death, <coughs> there were the mangled remains of a grasshopper. Well, as we uh, found the search of the suspects, in the suspect's pant leg, in the cuff of the pants, we found basically um, the left hind leg of a grasshopper. And this is what was left of the left hind leg of the grasshopper on the victim. His attorney claimed that this didn't mean anything because grasshoppers always broke their legs exactly like that. Nobody really bought it. And this is a picture of a dead frog sticking its tongue out has nothing to do with the presentation. I just kind of like the slide. 
<laughs> so that basically is what I have. Uh, went a little bit over. Sorry about that. But uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the insightful presentation. The wonderful sharing on the insect as tourist indicator, great content with eye capturing images. <laughs> so for all <laughs> the participants, please fill up the attendance form that has been attached to the chat box. Okay, we're now going to begin answering the question from the floor. The participants can turn on the sound and ask directly to our professor. But if you are unable to turn on your sound and joining us through our YouTube live, you can leave your comments at the chat box. So we will start our first Q&A session with our first question from the chat box uh, by Lee Lan Min Soon. Hi, good morning, Prof. For the composed body with positive PCR COVID-19 result, I wonder if the virus COVID-19 will be there in the maggots and any guideline for handling the maggots for the situation? Um, to the best of my knowledge, no one has really looked at the uh, COVID-19 virus and the maggots. Uh, would not surprise me to see it there. It seems to show up everywhere. As far as the means of transmission, I'm not sure that would be something I would worry about. Okay. Hi, Prof. Can I ask questions? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm Rahayu. I just need uh, to clarify, you know, because in your presentation regarding the uh, maggots and also the toxicology, because of the error in the post-mortem interval, uh, is it like a practice uh, in your country, the way you practice it, that whenever you collect maggots for the PMI, you also do toxicology at the same time so that you can get more correct uh, PMI? Uh, whenever possible. Uh, it is collected and it's done. However, keep in mind some of the toxicological analyses tend to get a little pricey and mm -hmm. you also have to have someone who will be able to collect it um, correctly. Okay, sometimes uh, I don't get there, and what's what happens is you have uh, the beat cop who uh, goes and does the collection, and sometimes they don't quite understand what they're supposed to do. I get some very interesting collections sometimes. Um, another question, Prof, regarding the antimortem injury and also the maggots. Will there be a difference, for example, if you have a post-mortem injury, artifact and then there will be um, a maggot infestation at the area compared to the perimortem uh, injury or antimortem injury okay typically uh, <clears throat> a post-mortem injury is not nearly as attractive to the flies for oil position so you will not see a tremendous concentration of the maggots there okay uh, okay. perimortem antimortem the blood's flowing, it's closer to a mucous membrane. And this seems to be more what they are attracted to. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Hi, good, good morning. Can you hear me? Uh, I'm Dr. Yes. Aisha from uh, National University of Malaysia. So uh, thank you, Prof. Goh, for, for today's very interesting and exciting seminar. Um, and thank you for Fun and Toilet for inviting us. Lah. Uh, I have uh, a couple of questions. Could you kindly share your experience? Um, how forensic entomological data is used in the cases of uh, suicide, suicidal cases? And can you actually differentiate uh, between suicide and homicide case, Prof? Thank you very much. Okay. Um, in suicide casing cases, uh, it is mostly concentrated on just when did the individual die. In all honesty, uh, I am not a pathologist. <coughs> Pardon me. 
Uh, I'm not a pathologist, and I wouldn't presume to try and differentiate between suicide and homicide. Yeah. Be out of line. Uh, Apologize for this cough. I don't know what where that came from. Bless you, <laughs> Prof. Uh, <laughs> can you please stop presenting your slide so that people can have a better look at you? No. <laughs> oh. As soon as I figure out how to. <laughs> you just press the stop presenting, the green button. Yeah. yeah. No, no, not that one. Okay. The green okay. one. I don't have it. Above Miss Varantini Maharaja image. <laughs> Below. In the middle. Orang sama. Oh, stop presenting. Yeah, follow sampai sini. Thank you, Prof. Okay, how's it? Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we shall continue with yeah. anyone yeah, who has more yeah. questions to Prof. And can please the participants silent your, uh, mute your laptop. Thank you. Okay, so next question. Hi, um, my name's Amber. Um, so hi from Miami right now. So it's it's late at night for oh. us here. Um, but I was just curious. So when you put out the pig wrapped in the blanket, I thought that was really interesting. Um, but I just, how did so you determine when the flies like made it through the blanket? Okay, what uh, happened was I would have to unwrap it. I had a very large net. <laughs> it covered both me and the pig. And so I do that to keep the uh, uh, other flies out. Once it was unwrapped, then I'd wrap it back up again and uh, put it back. So uh, I'd be basically going over the pig and uh, checking to see if I could find anything on it. So it was a That's visual uh, examination. Very I had no idea how much interest my neighbors had in my backyard until I put the pig out. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so Prof, next we have from Xin Lang Chong. Can I know what's the way to preserve the maggots or larvae for toxicology analysis? And do we have this type of test in Malaysia? If there is, do you know which Malaysian Institute offer this type of test? Um, okay, basically, uh, I freeze it. That uh, seems to be the best uh, for the uh, uh, tox labs over here. I'm not familiar with the toxicology labs in Malaysia. There's still <laughs> who would be able to do it? Well, maybe so, I can. Yeah. Dr. Yeah. Chin can address this question. Yeah, the second part of the question: Where Malaysia, in a way. Can we, we can send a sample. Currently, we can try the chemistry department uh, uh, of Malaysia government, or you can send to the university, yeah, university lab. So uh, as, as for now, Fun and Lab is trying to develop uh, the HPLC method, uh, of course, in collaboration with other lab in other uh, university. Uh, we try to offer this service in future, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chin. Uh, next, from Amber McTennis, when do you put, when do you put out the pig wrap in the blanket? How did you determine when the flies made it through the blanket? Okay, I think we just did that one, right? Yeah. So actually, it was by actually looking putting a net over myself and the pig, and then uh, doing a visual examination. Okay. Uh, can I can I ask another question? Sorry? Yes, please. Uh, um, uh, last time, uh, when I sent sample to the Institute of Medical Research in Malaysia, they are using monkey. So, Prof, will there be any difference, you know, using the monkey and the pig? For the source, you know, when we want to see the postmortem interval. 
Uh, not for the development of the uh, of the flies, but a lot of it depends on the size of the uh, monkey that they would be using. Okay. Uh, hi, okay. Prof. Oh, all right. Hi. Sorry. Uh, hi, Prof. I think I'll just uh, have a very quick um, question. I'm from Malaysia, but I did my uh, education and everything in the UK. So, um, and I've also had my master's done in the Australia. So looking around um, the different areas uh, and geographical location, um, and since I am a forensic anthropology, so I look at bones most of the time. Right. And looking at entomological um, specimens and all, I wanted to know what, how do you think it's different um, to look at insects based on these different geographical uh, locations? Because you have the different change of climate and then the temperature and so on. So how do you expect to have like a minimum post-mortem interval depending on these different geographical locations like because the standards are developed based on those particular population and those particular um, environments so how do you uh, what do you suggest actually well uh, basically <clears throat> one of the things you'll find is that the uh, carrion frequenting or the uh, decomposing uh, species are very widespread and there is a certain amount of uniformity in the developmental rates. Whenever possible, uh, I try to get uh, data from wherever I'm working. So the closer you are to the area, then the more accurate uh, things will be. Okay. Thank you. Thank but you. But it's there's a lot that we don't know yet. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, next we have a question from YouTube. Is it possible to know where the victim was actually murdered? Uh, depends. Uh, again, this goes back to the geographic distribution of the, uh, of the insects. If you have the body being moved a considerable distance, you may move into a different population of insects. This then would allow you to go back and pinpoint more closely uh, where the death actually occurred. But again, there's a lot of variation. And you can't say with any absolute uh, certainty that this is where the individual um, was murdered. Okay, so it's a individual case uh, type of situation. And next, back to our Google Meet from Sajad Ahmad. What are the basic things that a forensic entomologist need to know to determine the minimum PMI? <clears throat> okay, you have to know the um, um, species of insect that you are dealing with the particular stage of development that you're dealing with. You have to know the ambient temperatures <clears throat> because insect development is going to be dependent on the uh, temperatures. Um, those would be the three that have to be there all the time. But the more information you have, the better. Okay. And as we are shortage of time, I think this is the last question from the chat box. Uh, Amber Mechanist, many times I see pig carcasses as a substitute for human for determining insect succession and development rate data. How does using an animal compared to using a human? Are the insects are the same and the development rates are the same? Okay, the uh, pig has proven to be <clears throat> probably our best animal model. It's the closest to a human being in terms of the uh, structure. And by that, I, I'm talking about the head, the trunk, like this. I'm not, not going to worry with the uh, arms and legs. Okay, but the pig seems to be the animal that most closely um, approximates human decomposition. 
in there. So that's that's why we're we're basically using the pigs. The other thing is it's much easier to find some place uh, to decompose a pig than it is to say decompose a human being. Okay, there are a lot of a uh, lot of problems that come up. However, we have an awful lot of uh, humans that are donating their bodies in there. So the supply is not nearly as limiting as the uh, areas in which we can put the body out to, for decomposition study. Okay, Prof, I get a few comments asking uh, to expand uh, the duration of the Q&A session. Is it okay with you, Prof? Uh, I can go for a little bit more. I probably uh, got to give up the computer here in a little bit. Okay, okay, there. So you can just place your question at the chat box and we will assure that we will uh, email you with the answer later. But for now, I need to give uh, the chance to the participant uh, who can turn on the sound and ask question. A few questions more to our professor, please. Uh, hi, Prof. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I would like to ask you, uh, what are the difficulties that you found uh, when you started your uh, your career in forensic entomology? Uh, <clears throat> had uh, problems first with law enforcement. At the time I got into this, which was, uh, gee, that's scary. Well, that's 30, almost 40 years ago now. Uh, no one was doing it. They had not heard of it, and when somebody suddenly shows up at your police station and says, yeah, I'd like to look at maggots on a dead body, uh, they get to be a little bit skeptical. So it took a long time to overcome that. Uh, strangely, we had a lot of negative reaction from the entomological community. Uh, was some kind of a feeling that we should uh, kind of get ourselves back in order and go back and work with uh, agriculture like everybody else. So those were probably the two main uh -huh. problems. Strangely, I did not have much difficulty with the courts. With the police, uh, you didn't have any problem or? With police, I had some problems. Okay. Yeah, when you show up at a crime scene with a butterfly net on your back riding a motorcycle, uh, they look at you very strangely. <laughs> In fact, one of the individuals, uh, Wilson Sullivan, that I worked with very closely, uh, the first time he saw me, he wanted to arrest me. <laughs> so you, you, you see the difference now with, uh, or, or you still see difficulties uh, to use forensic entomology in a court or with the police? There will be some, always, I think, be some difficulties. In there, but then we still have people arguing about fingerprints. <laughs> okay. And one of, so. one of the problems we have to watch is people tend to get carried away, and they try to claim that they are more accurate than they can be. And every time they do this, they go out on a limb, and uh, they wind up hurting the discipline. So, problems on both sides. Thank you so much, Doctor. Yeah. Prof, I have another question. <laughs> yeah. Um, like in your case, just now regarding the female uh, victim, you said that the uh, interval is actually 10 and a half days. So in this kind of cases, when you combine your report, uh, do you actually state that, for example, you know, if the body was found outside, if the body was actually shred, do you comment in it so that, you know, instead of 10 and a half day that you find, there actually another uh, time during which, uh, before the fly can actually come in and lay their eggs. Do you comment on that also because that will really help in the court? Well, usually the commentary will come during the court proceedings. And there, I will would write initially uh, my report saying 10 and a half days. That's my pre preliminary report. At the bottom of every report, I say I s reserve the right uh, to alter my interpretation should additional data become available. Okay, so then when something else comes up, um, I, in fact, will then put in a supplementary report. 
Uh, we have one question from Amira Hanan Menti. Luffy, as she cannot turn on the sound, she urgently need to know whether there's manipulating the condition of the bait. In example, having burn tissue affect the arrival of scuttle flies compared on normal bait. Uh, I missed the first. There's manipulating the condition of the bait. In example, having burn tissue affect the arrival of scuttleflies. Okay, scuttleflies in particular, uh, I have not dealt with too much. And we're talking about the forides, I would assume. In many of the califorids and many of the sarcophagids, <coughs> burnt tissue uh, actually seems quite attractive to them. And in some of the studies that we did uh, with uh, Frank Avila, uh, we actually had uh, flies. We were burning the uh, burning the pigs, and one end of the pig would still be on fire, and the flies were already landing and attempting to oviposit and feed. <laughs> Yeah. Your, your mic is your, your mic is mute. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> okay. okay, so last one from the chat box. Have you ever come across a case where you have used beetles for the PMI estimation? Uh, not as the primary indicator. However, I have used them, uh, particularly the dermestids, as uh, supplementary evidence. Yeah, there. But uh, generally speaking, they're not precise enough to uh, keep everybody really happy for the total estimate. <laughs> okay, maybe we can have one last question from the audience that who can turn on uh, the sound. Can I ask a question? Uh, I'm Lotus Shan from UKM, from National University of Malaysia. Thank you, Prof. Law, for your exciting uh, talk. And thank you for Fun and Tole for inviting us. Uh, I just would like to ask for your comment, uh, for your information, we did an experiment 10 years ago, approximately 10 years ago, by placing monkeys carcasses on top of the 13th floor building. And we found that the species and also the numbers of flies visiting the carcasses were limited as compared to the carcasses that we placed on ground. So maybe we, uh, you have uh, any comment on this talk, the, the different distribution of flies uh, top of the building and also on ground. Uh, yeah, I've observed that also. Very similar situation working at one point uh, on the sixth floor of the entomology uh, building at uh, University of Hawaii. And we had a much more limited uh, assortment of insects coming on the roof than we did on the, uh, on the ground. So yeah, that, that's. I, I don't know if they're afraid of heights or what. <laughs> Interesting. Well, maybe, Adila, maybe I I can uh, ask the last question. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Prof. Goff, uh, what what would be your advice to the uh, younger generation of forensic entomologists? Uh, well, I guess the main advice would come towards the idea that we're, we're now starting to move into an actual, say, deliberate selection of forensic entomology as a profession. And what they need to do is not only get a very strong background in entomology, but they should also look at uh, some courses in forensic anthropology, <clears throat> uh, take a look at some pathology, things of this nature, uh, the wider your education, the better in there. If you major in entomology and you do this very limited uh, too soon, uh, you're going to handicap yourself. Better off with a wider knowledge. I wish I had. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, okay.
Okay, with that, I think we have come to the end. Thank you, Professor Dr. Lee Goff, and thank you everyone for attending to this webinar. Sorry if we could not answer all the questions, but rest assured that I will email you guys with the answers. And a quick announcement on our next international webinar on 2nd June 2021. The invited speaker is Dr. Won Yang Lee from Division of Polar Life Sciences, Korea Polar Research Institute on behavioral ecology of chin strap and gentoo penguins at Narabski Point in King George Island, Antarctica. So, hoping and looking forward to meeting all of you in our next webinar series. And on behalf of the organizer and our presenters, thank you for joining us today. And have a great rest of your day. Stay safe, everyone. Bye. Okay. okay. Bye. Thank you for having me. Thank you.